uh, by creating Christianity is they uh, borrowed all of these ideas of these popular religions around them held by their conquerors, the Greeks and then the Romans, and created a new religion. Wait, say what? Is Richard Carrier making the claim that Christianity is a copycat religion? Yes, that's indeed what he's saying. So in this video, I'm going to show you three fallacies to that actual position. So let's jump into it. All right, so here's where this belief that Christianity is a copycat religion that comes from people like Richard Carrier and others who hold to the same position. In the Mediter Mediterranean world, supposedly, they go back and say there was these different Jewish sects that were out there, different religions and movements and ideas. And eventually what they were doing is they were copying and being influenced by other Greek myths and they're formulating new ideas that were taken from paganism or uh, syncretism. Okay, so they were formulating what eventually became an early rendition of Christianity. And what he was talking about in that video, and I'm gonna show you in a quote in a minute, is that Jews, as things were unfolding and not happening under Roman rule, they took upon themselves to start crafting a new religion that was influenced by Hellenistic teachings and again, pagan practices. And you put it all in a pot and you mix it up and boom, here's early version of Christianity. And it wasn't until people like the half-brother of Jesus, which of course, if Jesus didn't exist and there was no James or maybe, maybe there was a guy like James, but he of course wasn't the brother of Jesus because Jesus didn't exist. But they started to take upon themselves and in, in creating new ideas about Christianity and writing letters to their followers, to their cult system. And of course, a guy named Paul the Apostle comes on scene and he's the one who really puts Christianity on the map. And more or less, that's the Christianity that we follow to this very day. So look at this quote that comes from Richard Kerr directly from his website. He says, it would be several decades later when subsequent members of this cult after the world had not yet ended as claimed, started allegorizing the gospel of this angelic being. So he's talking about Christianity and this angelic being being Jesus Christ by placing him in earth history as a divine man, as a commentary on the gospel in its relation to society in the Christian mission. The same had already been done to other celestial gods and heroes who were being transported into earth history all over the Greco-Roman world, a process now called Eumerization after the author Eumerius, who began the trend in the 4th century BC by converting the celestial Zeus and Uranus into ordinary human kings and placing them in past earth history, claiming they were later deified in a book ironically titled Sacred Scripture. Other gods then underwent the same transformation from Romulus, originally the celestial deity Quirinius, to Osiris, originally the heavenly lord, whom pharaohs claimed to resemble. He was eventually transformed into an historical pharaoh himself. So in essence, what Richard Carrier is showing in that brief description that comes from his website is in the Greco-Roman world, things started to take shape into Christianity. And Jesus, this figure, was nothing more than this angelic being in Greek mythology. And eventually these new revolutionists, these zealots, if you will, in Judaism, started to see him more as a figure, as a divine figure. That's how they made him. So it's it, they concocted this story. Now, this isn't anything new. Richard Kerr is not original to these things. Matter of fact, there's a book called The Jesus Mysteries. Was the original Jesus a pagan god? This was published in 1999, and it was written by uh, Freck and Gandhi. And they say this in their book, as far back as the 1840s, Bruno Bayer began to publish views that the story of Jesus was rooted in myth. Bayer's greatest influence, notice, was one of his own students. Guess who that was? Karl Marx, who promoted the view that Jesus never existed. This view eventually became part of, of, of communist dogma. So I'm not sure if you're aware of that. So this shows you kind of the danger behind all this stuff. But before the Jesus Mysteries book, there was a famous book by Sir James Fraser, who was an anthropologist, and he published The Golden Bow of 1890. And what it is, it's a compilation of Eastern Mediterranean religions that all hold to mythical figures dying and reviving during the harvest season. Now, Fraser classifies, catch this, that Christianity is one of these pagan religions. And so what he did is he goes on to publish 
a multi-volume set defending his claims. Well, here's the thing, you guys, from Carrier's standpoint to uh, the Jesus Mysteries to the Golden Bow, these things have been debunked. They've been debunked by a lot of scholars in the 20th, by the time of the 20th century, most reputable scholars have debunked this position. It hasn't been until recent years, once again, like I said, from the Jesus Mysteries, that it kind of started to resurrect this position. And again, Dr. Richard Kerr being one of the more, uh, more renowned individuals of this alternative position that Jesus Christ never exists and Christianity is just a copycat, started to take shape more and is hitting you know mainstream on YouTube and other channels and social media. So that's how this stuff kind of got resurrected. Now, here's the other thing that I want to show you, though. There's another book that is, it's, it's kind of a funny title. It's called The Laughing Jesus, Religious Lies and Gnostic Wisdom. And in this book, listen to this quote that they have directly in the book. It says, the Jesus story has all the hallmarks of a myth. You're thinking, okay, well, why is that? Well, says, well, we'll give you a reason why we believe it. And it's quite simple. You're thinking, okay, well, this is going to be pretty enlightening, isn't it? It says, it is a myth. So the hallmark of a myth, well, it's pretty simple why it's a myth, because it's a myth. Indeed, not only is it a myth, it's a Jewish version of a pagan myth. So now they're saying, we're really going to get to the source of things. So they go a little bit further in the book, and this is what uh, they talk about. They say, after Osiris came, many other virgin-born, resurrected savior gods, Dionysus, which is a Grecian god, Krishna, a Hindu god, Mithra, a Persian god, which is modern-day Iran, uh, Tamaz, Sumerian, Babylon, it says, since Krishna allegedly lived centuries before Jesus, this is sufficient reason, notice, to suspect that Jesus was merely a counterfeit, oh, okay, of who? Of Krishna and all the other savior gods who were worshipped throughout the pagan world long before Jesus. So in their own argument, they're saying, this is why we believe Christianity is a copycat. Jesus Christ is a counterfeit because it has copied from other religions. Now they give in the book 13 similarities and that's what I'm going to show you in these fallacies why they're actually inconsistent. One, they're saying this terminology about a, a father God sending his son to a mother virgin goddess that has already existed. So Christianity copied from other Greek mythology or pagan beliefs. Uh, saying that Jesus was hailed by his followers as a savior, in the case as a Messiah. Uh, God made him flesh. He becomes a son of God. That's already been taught in other Greek mythology. He is born in a cave or humble cow shed on the 25th of December in front of shepherds are saying that's shown to be false, which in fact, again, I'm not going to dive into this, but nowhere in Christianity does it teach about being Jesus was born December 25th. And there's nothing in dates that we have that even says it in Greek mythology. So that's just a, a complete nonsense right there. Now, the thing that we have to understand though, is that uh, when I laid out that quote about Osiris and Mithra and Tamaz, what they're showing you is they're saying, look, all the stuff existed prior to Christianity. And that's it. If we could prove that that is in fact is not true, we show the fallacies behind it, it debunks their theory. Now, again, I'm not in this video saying because it debunks the theory, therefore Christianity is true. I'm just showing you that the theory of Christian of Christianity being a copycat religion is false. That's all I'm, that's all I'm going to be addressing in this video. Nothing more. Now, of course, as a Christian, as a, as a, as a Christian thinker, uh, I clearly and strongly support the, the, not just the idea, but the belief that Christianity is in fact the one true religion, that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through him. I believe the inspired word of God, the 66 books that we call the word of God is inspired from God himself. So, but that's not what I'm going to be addressing in this video, I want to, at this point in time, show you the fallacies behind copycat Christianity, this particular theory. And I'm going to show you three fallacies. The first one I'm going to show you is the composite fallacy. The second one is a terminological fallacy. And the third and final fallacy is the dependency fallacy. And I'm going to break down them one by one. So let's start actually with the first one. And that is the composite fallacy. Now, the supposed unified religion 
is very misguided and it mistreats the gospel record, records. And that's important to understand. What I mean by that is that the, com the composition fallacy says if there's any overlap or similarity, if some of the parts come from something else, the whole parts come from that whole thing. So if there's anything that we can show that Christianity has similarity to something else, all of its parts in Christianity come from something else. It can't be original to itself. That's a fallacy. So that's why I was saying the supposed unified religion is very misguided and it completely mistreats the gospel records because the gospel records are not copying another story. Now, again, if you want to go deeper into that stuff, there are so many other materials. As I said, I, I cite things in my Stand Strong in Your Faith book. You can go to my buddy Jim Warner Wallace's stuff that he does in, in Cold Case Christianity. And again, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. You can look at um, Evidence Demands a Verdict. And there's so many other books, but just on the top of my head, I'm just throwing that out there. Now, what I want to say to the claims that people like Richard Carey are making why they're fallacies is that there's no pre-Christian doctrine of rebirth for the early writers of Christianity to borrow. Not to this precision. Matter of fact, Jewish Christians would never blend their beliefs. So if you understand Mediterranean, the Mediterranean world and ancient times of Judaism and the religion itself, and you talk to my good buddy like Dr. Michael Brown and other people who are uh, Messianic Jews, they will tell you the belief system of Judaism in no way, shape, or form is syncretic. Syn syncretic. There's no syncretism in it. They're not copying. Judaism was not inclusive like other Gentile religions. And see, that's the point. Because other Gentile religions were inclusive, therefore they're assuming at that same time of history in the Mediterranean world, Judaism itself was inclusive. That is a fallacy. Listen to what my friend Lacona has to say in regards to this. Think of who the earliest Christians were. They were pious Jews who often debated over the minutia of the Jewish law. They debated over matters such as whether Christians could eat meat that had been sacrificed to idols, whether Jewish Christians could eat in the same room as Gentile Christians, whether um, Jewish Christians needed to maintain the temple purification rites, whether Gentile male Christians needed to be circumcised. Now, when you're debating over minor matters of the Jewish law to this extent, do we really imagine that these same Jewish leaders would borrow wholesale from pagan myths to form the foundation of their own? It seems unreasonable. Now, let's get into the second fallacy, the terminological fallacy. I'm going to give you my second rebuttal here. Now, this is to use Christian terminology on pagan beliefs in order to show a parallel. And this is why it's a fallacy. It comes from Dr. Gregory Boyd in his book, The Jesus Legend, an excellent book, The Jesus Legend. He writes, Dr. Boyd does, quote, while things are certainly parallel uh, in terms, that's key, they may be parallel in terms that are used in early Christianity, in the mystery religions, again, some things we don't even know factually and historically about them, there is little evidence for parallel concepts. So just because some terms may be the same, they may not even be interpreted the same. It's like Mormons using the term Christian and Protestant Christians using the term Christian, you know, Bible teaching Christians that don't hold to anything outside of the word of God, okay, biblical Christians. Just because they both use a term Christian doesn't mean that they mean the same thing or they come from the same origin. That is important to understand. Samuel Sandmel's book called Paralomania in the Journal of Biblical Literature, this was published in 1962. In essence, what he talks about in his work is the work that, that you see unfolding within Christianity does not, he says, come from secular means, doesn't come from synchristic ways. He says this, that the work proves that many secular scholars attempt to find parallels when you're looking at these pagan myths in Jesus. He says, that's just not the case. There, there are none. All the Greek myths that you find in the book that uh, Paralomania, all the Greek myths are legends. Whereas Jesus is a real historical figure. So when you look at the gospel accounts and, and you look at the rise of Christianity, that took place 
and and that it, and then that it took place at the heart of Jerusalem, okay? Not anywhere else, but in the heart where the temple was. So you're having Jews who are now known as Christians. We would, you know, not early that time, but we know them to be followers of Jesus Christ, part of the way. You see the literal fulfillment of Jesus to the Jewish scriptures, and that's where they're going to make the case in Jerusalem. And 50 days later, after the resurrection, supposedly, right, that the the new apostles give an account in the women. Peter would stand up on the day of Pentecost, 50 days removed from this historical event. The Holy Spirit comes upon them and they preach the gospel and a thousand souls come to Christ. And you're thinking, where is that? That is not taught in anything else. Matter of fact, let me give you a quote that comes from Dr. Geyser and Frank Turek from I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. And by the way, I wrote the study guide to that book for my dear friends and a lot of churches and a lot of individuals use it. So when you buy the book, make sure you get the study guide. But notice they write this in the book. The first real parallel of a dying and rising God does not appear until 80, 150, more than 100 years after the origin of Christianity. So if there was any influence of one on the other, it was the influence of the historical event of the New Testament, which is the resurrection, on mythology, not the reverse. The only known account of a god surviving death that predates Christianity is the Egyptian cult god Osiris. In this myth, Osiris is cut into 14 pieces, scattered around Egypt, then reassembled and brought back to life by the goddess Isis. However, Osiris does not actually come back to physical life, but becomes a member of a shadowy underworld. This is far different than Jesus' resurrection account where he was gloriously risen, prince of life, who was seen by others on earth before his ascension into heaven. And if there are myths about dying and rising gods prior to Christianity, that doesn't mean the New Testament writers copied from them. The fictional TV show Star Trek preceded the U.S. space shuttle program, but that does not mean that newspaper reports of space shuttle missions are influenced by Star Trek episodes. So that's why the terminological fallacy is that it doesn't add up just because there's similarity. So for example, when you do look um, at Adonis, and this is someone that Carrier and other people will use as examples that Christianity has copied from. So the claim is that he was born from a virgin mother, Myra, M-Y-R-R-H-A. Now here's the facts of the tale. And why? Just because there might be some similarity in some of these these terms. And again, to say that they copied from Christianity or Christianity copied from them doesn't mean that they didn't copy from someone else. But the bottom line is the facts of the tale is a Greek symbol uh, it, that we see within the story is about the harvest seasons, as I was mentioning earlier. So there may be some revivalism that takes place within the harvest seasons, within the vegetation cycles, but that doesn't point anywhere to resurrection. So that's a fallacy of taking terms about vegetation, about the harvest seasons to resurrection. Now, one source mentions Odinus dying by Eris, who is a dis- who is disguised as a boar. So parallel references of Odinus to Jesus don't even come until later in the second century. So again, historically, it doesn't even add up. So when you look at the story itself, which doesn't come until second century after Christianity, it has nothing, no bearing, no similarity to the gospel accounts. Another one that comes to mind is when you look at Dionysus, the claim was that he was born from a virgin. However, the facts of the tale is simply this. He was conceived by a mortal, Samil, who is the son of Zeus. So again, there is no similarity whatsoever between uh, Dionysus and Jesus Christ. The bottom line, you guys, and it's important to to, to, to point this out, these pagan tales are nothing more than anachronism. Anachronism. What that is, is a false arrangement. It's a false chronological uh, layer of evidence. Matter of fact, chronologically, it's inconsistent. So they try to force these arguments in, or they, they try to force these evidences to make their argument. And it just is unfounded these faulty parallels fail to realize the strict Jewish culture of that time. As I was mentioning before, this is what we cannot downplay when it comes to Judaism. Judaism 
was a monotheistic, and it still is, a monotheistic belief system that does not believe in other gods. There was no exchanging of syncretism um, ideals at all. To go from Judaism to paganism does not happen among them. Jesus Christ claimed to be the Jewish Messiah. He claimed to fulfill prophecy. He was without sin. He did not come to eliminate the law, but he came to fulfill the law. And out of that came Christianity. That There's no similarity of that in any other religion whatsoever. So we have to keep that in mind when dealing with this position that Christianity is a copycat religion. And finally, the third fallacy is the dependency fallacy. And this is my third rebuttal to this position. And it's this, to say Christianity is dependent on Hellenistic mystery religions is completely and totally false. What people have to understand is that there's no archeological evidence to support that pagan or Hellenistic and or Hellenistic religions heavily influenced the Jews in the first century Palestine. There's none. Christianity is not dependent on any one of those things. Nor do we see anything in the Pauline epistles as well in his counterparts like Jude and Peter and James of seeing Greek uh, uh, philosophy as the source of their thoughts or their beliefs. Matter of fact, the apostle John and Paul, they may have differentiated between their theological beliefs but one of the things in, in terms of how they were viewing Gnosticism and Greek mythology, because they use different terminology, Paul was more educated than Peter. But you clearly see John, Paul, they were refuting a false teaching that was going against or countering that of Christianity. That's what you actually see. You don't see them formulating these ideas and having these theological beliefs on the backbone of Gnosticism or paganism. There's no syncretism in Paul's teaching, John's teaching, James' teaching, Jude's teaching, etc. None whatsoever. Now, Christian August Lobeck in 1829, he reaffirmed what Dr. Bruce Metzger said in his book, Historical and Literary Studies, that the ancient pagan mysteries that came and went have found, uh, credit, have found no, there's been no credibility. So when you take these pagan mysteries that we've had circulating, there's no credible stance whatsoever that Christianity's foundation is on those pagan beliefs. None. There's no evidence. Christian August Lobeck, Dr. Bruce Metzger have pointed that out. Matter of fact, in his book, he says, quote, a great deal of rubbish and pseudo learning has swept aside and it became possible to discuss intelligently the rites and teachings of the mysteries. That's what's happened. We've accepted these fallacies. We've accepted people making assertions and not claims, not being supported by archaeology, not supported by uh, what we know historically in, in chronological order. Because once we look at the evidence, it overwhelmingly supports Christianity being an original religion that was birthed from Judaism. Matter of fact, Oxford University historian Robin Lane Fox asserts that nearly all the supposed parallels between pagan practices and Christianity are spurious or literally illegitimate. They are not supported by the facts. So I hate to break to Dr. Richard Carrier and people like him who believe that Christianity is a copycat religion. They have no evidence to support their claims. Therefore, they're merely assertions. Now, his research led him to conclude that, quote, a marginal and weak connection between paganism and Christianity exists. And that's actually in Leon McKenzie's book, and another helpful resource that I want to share with you guys to debunk parallelism, parallelism, it's it's uh, Leon McKenzie's book, Pagan Resurrection Myths, and also The Resurrection of Jesus. And I love this book, by the way, by Dr. Ronald Nash called Gospel in the Greek. The Gospel in the Greek is an excellent book. So the bottom line, you guys, when we look at these fallacies, as I mentioned the composite fallacy, the terminological fallacy, and the dependence fallacy, uh, the mythification that is being taught today in um, universities or you're watching on YouTube channels, it doesn't disprove Christianity. Christianity is true in its own right. Study its claims. Look at the evidence, archaeological evidence, historical evidence, theological reasoning. And the thing is that when you actually see the, the, the teaching of parallelism, 
that Christianity copied these different myths, it actually is a good thing. It actually proves that Christianity is true. Matter of fact, J. Ed uh, Kom- Komoswinski, if I'm saying his name right, I've read some of his stuff. He's an excellent scholar. He writes this, quote, the Christian message did not plagiarize the writings of pagan religions. There is no substantiated connection between belief in the virgin birth and resurrection of Christ with the cults of Osiris, Dionysus, or Mithra. Alleged parallels between early religions and Christianity are not sustainable when the evidence is fairly examined, end quote. So my friends, I think the bottom line is this. When you look at any type of claims people make about uh, against Christianity, I should say, study it, examine it, test it. Because the thing is, is when you see people like Richard Carey, again, he's a, he's an historian, he's a scholar. He's been studying a lot of this kind of stuff. He's an expert in Mediterranean religions and syncretism. But the thing is he fails to do is he fails to see Christianity as an original religion that came from Judaism that was not tainted, that was not copying other pagan practices because at the heart of Judaism, Christianity, they're monotheistic. They would never do that. They would never compromise and commit that type of act. And that's what he's saying they're doing. So be encouraged to know that Christianity is not a copycat religion. Study the word of God. Study the historicity of Jesus Christ. Look at his claims to being God, the claims of him healing the sick and casting out demons and fulfilling prophecy. There are so many amazing pieces of evidence that are overwhelming that are out there that you can dive right into and be assured to know that Christianity is in fact true. So I hope the composite fallacy, the terminological fallacy, and the dependency fallacy are great ways to look at these claims against Christianity and you can rebut them as I did on this video. So my friends, I thank you guys for watching this video. If you've never subscribed to my channel, I'd love, love if you would subscribe to the channel and continue to like posts like this and share these type of videos out there with your friends. And until next time, keep standing strong, my friends.